Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here in TNO, the last days of Europe, in which we are playing as RK Aus Africa, in which, even though I've played as him before, we're using a special sub-mod for this campaign called Africa Adio, a TNO Reichstadt expansion, so we're going to see what that sub-mod has in store, but we really need to become the big old gross Africa show Reichstadt eventually to do that, but we're going to replay... At Aus Africa, because I've played them before, and see what the economy's like for them, and just kind of see what good times are rolling here. Also, we have Hutig's Yee Booty Haircut. Getting that drip. What does this one do? Oh. Oh. He's kind of... He's kind of wide. You can't... Wow. Funny moment. Okay, anyways. We can do hard mode, but this is my first time in, actually, Toolbox Area, the time recording, and going to do the South African War. Uh, difficulty, I don't know about that. So, the vast wealth of Africa. We have a minister from the Quillamane, indeed rich in natural resources. So, <clears throat> we basically pay money to get a couple more resources here if we want, which would probably be very good. So, we can buy chromium. We can buy a lot of stuff from Germany, except for like guns, which cost money. Um, let's see. Let's take a look here. Trade, and we'll talk about some focuses as well. Do we need anything? Honestly, not really, but except for steel. Of course, uranium. Or I guess consumer goods. Uh,. Steel and oil. So, for now, how about we grab some steel? So, I'll put plain and simple. Oh, we, oh, we just keep buying stuff. I mean, it adds 5 billion to the debt. Okay. Because right now, our economy is looking like this. And the macro side. 20% uh, debt GDP rating. We're actually at fair. Credit rating is fair, so that's not bad. It's not too bad at all, actually. But let's begin with our focus The Guardians of Africa. <clears throat> Africa's nest of vipers. As a land infested by bandits, overrun by rebels, endangered by terrorists, and even worse, full of traitors. It is clear by the day that, among the four Reich's commissariats, that we are the only ones actually defending the interests of Germania and the Dark Continent, and ensuring that the light of national daddyism still shines even in the pitch black jungles covering this heck hole. We are the guardians of Africa, and we'll ensure that our legacy lasts for a thousand years. No one else can be trusted. Not a single person. <clears throat> Let's see, clean the colony? Ah, oh, we like cleaning colony and stability. Our colony is rife with dissent. Uh, and voluntary workers who don't accept their place at the bottom of the racial pyramid. Tolerated natives who still fight for freedom and even the Aryans. Our own blood. Asking for reforms all weaken us from within when we should be at our strongest. It's time to crush these pathetic dissidents and remind everyone not only their place, but also that the, the Aryans' destiny is to dominate Africa forever. A concerted effort shall be undertaken from all offices of the colonial government in order to utterly destroy those who still haven't been vanquished in our earlier attempts. <coughs> Ah, uh, the Guardian of Africa. Shimmering in the torpid heat of the afternoon, the sun cast its golden rays across the deep emerald gardens. Long shadows flow down the white pebbled pathways where Borman has been named his successor. But wherever so often, every so often, a gardener could be glimpsed drifting through the gloom. There was a time of the afternoon where men grew weary as the hours stretched on, awaiting the evening coolness that heralded the workday's end. In stark contrast to the uh, slaves meandering throughout his umbral gardens, the ex-commissar Hans Hutek stood at attention. His spine as straight as the marble pillars that flanked him. From the ash shade of his palace balcony, he frowned down at the gardeners with distaste. Ignoring the sweat that soaked through his heavy woolen uniform, Hutek raised his mug to his lips and sipped, savoring the bitter taste of his afternoon coffee. Determined to preserve the purity of his Aryanism, it was one of the few luxuries he allowed himself. Finishing his coffee, Hutek returned to his office. A foul length of revolving fans cooled the air, battering it around the room. A stark contrast to the sweltering malaise of Africa it brought to mind nostalgic images of days spent in the wintry Saxony of his boyhood, so wiping such pointless sus from his mind with a determined efficiency, who takes up behind his enormous mahogany desk and continued his paperwork. As he drafted yet another letter to Germania, requesting more aid, men, and supplies. <clears throat> Hutig briefly wondered how Müller and Schenk were occupying the afternoon. He conjured the mental image of Müller peeing himself in a drunken stupor and Schenk's desk collapsing under the weight of unread reports. Neither of those indolent buffoons were fit to bear the title of Reichskommissar, only he had the will, strength, the purity to advance the Reich's interest in Africa. Smirking, he signed a letter, dumping it in the out tray, and snatched another document off the pile. He frowned as he read. It was a dossier detailing the results of an investigation near the collapse of a recently constructed bridge in Zambia. <clears throat> Which was blamed on poor planning by the German engineers in charge of the project. In a sudden fit of pique, he crumbled it into a ball and threw it in the wastebasket. Scowling, Hotek leaned back at the creaking of his chair, setting him on edge. Always, he was surrounded by idiots and incompetence. 
How was he supposed to impose the Aryan ideal on Africa when the drugs were all he ever got? The cravens, fools, bunglers, and exiles of Reich saw fit to dump in his lap. Germania seemed to think of Quillamane as a re refuse pale, fit only for the inadequate to serve in the Reich proper, but what, asked a little voice in the back of his mind, did that make him? For a moment, Hutig sat idle, doing nothing but listening to the fans, until their steady thrumping seemed indistinguishable from the beating of his heart. Then, signing through, sighing through his nose, the Reich's commissar bent forward to finish her crumpled dossier out of the wastebasket. He hated all this and suddenly couldn't get away. Also, I don't think I set up any planes here. Then again, we don't have any planes here. Well, that would explain it. Uh, buy steel. Uh, we still need more steel and oil, so getting a healthy amount of oil would be very good. 20.8%, not great. Also, we're spending max here. Ooh, naval expenditures. Uh, let's go to the bottom. There you go. Hurts our growth a little bit, but at the same time, we don't want too much of a deficit right now. Uh, let's see. So we're looking pretty good here. So we need anything else. Maybe another spot of aluminum, maybe eventually. We definitely need more consumer goods, though. So we don't have to spend things here. So we're not going to. How many guns do we have? Not enough. 0 0.01 billion? Hey, go get some guns just in case. You know, we're honestly probably going to need quite a few guns. Wow. He is just a local terrorizer. Look at that. I kind of like the way they did him. Clean the colony. The drums echo. The indolent dudes who should be our brothers are content just doing nothing. Miller spends his time hunting beasts he shares so much with, especially in the brain department, while Shank the traitor showers the fears and time and money could surely find a more productive use, but we are different. Yes, we are different. We have keen eyes and ears, and we know. We are the dust rising to the south, where our nation lies broken ready to collapse, and we hear the drums of war, those same drums who led our glorious daddy to begin his crusade against imperialism. We shall follow a shining example, let the drums roar, make them louder and louder. Meeting the General Bureau. Utik always found it amusing to call a meeting of the General Bureau to take place in a few hours, forcing his subordinates to scurry from their villas to his palace despite, desperate not to be the last to arrive, at last. Trying their best to look unflappable, his underlings had arrived by helicopter and chauffeured sedan and were seated in the palace's enormous conference room. The meeting was not without purpose. Always feeling the knife hovering behind his back, Utik had become suspicious of anti-national socialists and tendencies among of his fellow officers. Eyes and nobody looked around the table, glancing at each man in turn, noting who flinched and more importantly who didn't. Could anyone on the General Bureau have spirit sympathies? To anyone but Hutik, that would have been unthinkable. Eyeing his generals, he made the mental note to have them put under even more throne and surveillance. Many began, as the last summer began the room. We live in precarious times, I'll be brief. From the outside, we are threatened by the degenerates and the Judeo capitalists. From within, on the borders of the Rex Commissariat, we are troubled by rebels, escaped slaves, and so called revolutionaries. Though we may expect that the racial purity of our men uh, will lead us to victory, triumph is not so assured. To prevail against these threats that face us, we must root out the cancer at the heart of West Africa. Ost Africa. He paused looking around at his men, hoping for a reaction. They are looking nervous, always afraid of being replaced as a, as a favorite. Dupont, gray face as usual. Chimilski, Chimilwelski, and Mango staring back at him with dead, dead eyes. Stifling an annoyed sigh, Hutu continued, We cannot fight the barbarians when our own men are tainted by the stain of reformism. It's imperative that we root up the liberals in our ranks like weeds. They're not fit to serve the Reich, not fit to call themselves Arium. You will co cooperate with my intelligence operatives in hiding and liquidating these traitors. We cannot allow these subversives to undermine national daddyism. The conference continued, Hutig laying out a plan to eradicate the subversives, all the while feeling that the spectral knife drew closer and closer to his flesh. He had to scour the taint of treacherous stuff from West Africa without mercy, without quarter, before it was too late. I would just soon have expected restraint from a hyena prowling amongst corpses. Uh, ooh, more decryption? Okay, that's not bad. A ring of fire. More command by arms for Aryans. Uh, let me help you. Hmm. What do we want? Stability is pretty good to get. Expand the mind. Ooh, a ring of fire. Sure, why not? It's clear that also Africa is like a beast surrounded by fire all around us. Enemies lurk in the shadows, trying to take advantage of our numerical inferiority. It's like a swarm of bees bringing down a bear. Even our so-called allies cannot be trusted. We need to increase the alert and tie it to all those who would perish alongside us in the eventual eventuality of our defeat. Increasing our support among the superior races as much as possible. The fate of the Africana Irians depend on it. <clears throat> Africa Adio, they're Italians. The last thing the militia expected was two white people. Unarmed, wandering into the village from the thick of the bush. <clears throat> After managing to capture the village from Hutik's troops. <clears throat> Excuse me. The black rebels at uh, bunkered down, repelling any enemy scouts that came too close, but none of them had been brave or foolish like these two, who fell right into the hands of a rebel pa patrol. Screaming and pleading for mercy, they were dragged into the main square to be lined up against the wall, and much less, and much to the amusement of the militia, never stopped taking film even in their final moments. 
the leader of the militia. A massive black man wearing a pair of German military sunglasses alongside a similarly improvised uniform wanted to execute the two German scouts in person. Please, for God's sakes, we're not Germans, one shouted as the other kept filming despite numerous hands trying to grab his camera and his clothes. We're shooting a movie, a movie! Quickly, he produced documents from his pocket. Regno d'Italia. See the letters on the exterior. The rebel leader squinted, struggling to read the documents. Jacopo Petti? A few minutes later, the rebel leader, whose nom, nom de guerre was Simba, was treating the two Italians no longer as intruders but as welcome guests. With a smile on his face, he showed the two around the village, especially the place where the fighting had happened, where the grim remnants of the fallen German garrison and the collaborators later wrought. Our people will be free, Simba proclaimed before the camera, with a wide smile, gesturing towards the impaled skull of a German soldier, still wearing the Stahlhelm, now serving as a decoration for the village's main entrance. All of Africa will be free one day. That evening, Jacopetti Petti talked with a few of the Simba's men, all farmers, simple people driven to rebellion by desperation, as they sped towards the Sudwest African border on a looted German jeep. Simba was kind enough to comp compensate with a ride to the two Italians, who would soon consign him and his men to fame they deserve. Sudwest Africa beckons. Yes, and the ring of fire, please. Please, lots and lots of rings of fire. <clears throat> the drums echo. On to Tigros, as he always did, at a stroke of 5 o'clock. Following his rigorous morning exercise and a simple, nutritious breakfast of porridge and fruit, he donned his freshly pressed uniform and flung open the doors to his office, where he would work until the moon shone bright up in the night sky. After turning them on the many fans scattered around the room, who took Stroke to his desk as he sat here, heard the horrible creak of the chair that made his teeth rattle and his temples pulse. Scowling, his morning already thrown into disarray, he made a mental note to have the slave who had failed in the oath of simple task of fixing the chair flogged. Taking a deep breath, Hutig centered himself. Ignoring the pulsing headache he was already beginning to develop, he unfurled a map of sub-Saharan Africa, and taking his pen, began to circle settlements and military installations on the border with South Africa. Reich's Commissar Hutig did not think of himself a fool. He knew the fragile peace between the Reich's colonies and South Africa was tenuous at best. Though supposedly determined to maintain the neutrality, South Africa's Anglo-Saxon government found itself racked by internal intention caused by rebellious Boers and natives, which they were unable to resolve as a consequence of the pathetic degeneracy. The South African government increasingly maintained its precarious clutch on the nation, thanks to aid from the OFN, who were busy digging their claws into the allegedly neutral nation. An OFN alliance South Africa was an unacceptable threat to the Reich's interests in Africa. Hutek began to draw arrows towards Petersburg and Nelspruit. Their fragile peace would not last much longer. When the war came, he would be ready. It echoed loudly in him because he was hollow at the core. Hmm. Expand the mines. I want to do that one immediately. Can we get more money that way? Uh, building a stockpile would not be bad, but... Huh. Booby trap at the border. Door support stats. Ooh, munitions. Ooh, more liquid reserves, but... Ooh. Oh, we go here. Slave munitions. Home of the exiles. Uh, our officer corps is, of course, selected by the Heer from its HQ in Germany, or Germania, which means we have no choice over who is sent to serve here, of course. This has resulted in our officers being mostly exiles from the SS, removed from the mainland for their views not in line with mainstream national daddyism, and the mixed loyalties with Burgundy. Still, this could be an opportunity. As their skills grow and their zeal for the protection of the Aryan race is without peer. Also, some of their ideas about how to deal with corruption in the very other Reich's commissariats are very interesting. Four billion, not bad. It's, oh, I definitely shot up, but that's alright. Um... We haven't. What if we did a tax hike? Hmm. 49. Oh, we do military austerity. 0.2. Eh, that's not that much. Honestly, we have more. We have more naval expenditures than anything else. Is there really any point to keep the navy? Hmm. We get rid of the navy. That wouldn't be bad. We did. I mean, that's going to hurt our growth. Hmm. Military austerity. What if we were to get rid of the navy? Well, let's try it once and see what happens. Oh, we got close. Almost no growth now, but we got close. Military austerity, huh? Get more output. That would be nice, but we don't really need it, do we? Yeah, it's only 15. What do we do? Civilian austerity. Just to see what would happen. We'd actually have a surplus, and our growth would go down. Interesting. Okay. Sure, why not? Just, just messing around with the economy. Suspicions. Awareness returned to Hutik rapidly. He cursed under his breath, drew his hands away from his something head, and assumed his straight, straight in posture. Last night's drink would not be allowed to affect present behavior. After all, a week's day of mine was nothing more than middling degeneracy. The drink was not entirely about mere, however, as the epiphany had provided him a prompt to today's meeting. Come in, Gunther. Hutik noticed his hands fidgeting nervously as he took a seat. A good sign is meant his image preceded him. Uh, Rock Scribble you wanted to speak with me? Hutik thought for a moment, choosing his words carefully. Gunther, I'm sure you've noticed the discrepancies between our policy and that of our neighbors. He paused, letting the taboo words sit in the still air. Recognizing that his subordinate's wariness to speak frankly, he continued. In a foreign land such as this, loyalty to the fatherland is of the utmost importance. We remain surrounded by subhuman savages and vessels of corruption. It's precisely for this reason I can, I, that I call upon you, a most steadfast SS officer, for this assignment. 
upon the realization that this was not a disciplinary hearing. Gunter's tense disposition relaxed. While well, ex-commissar may have been a paranoid man, but Gunter was clearly not the one under suspicion today. Hutig slid a satchel across the desk, appearing into Gunter's eyes. You are entered to enter Central Africa under the guise of reassignment. Close are the, all the relevant documents. Observe operations today and take care to remember the highest ideals of the Fatherland. After a period of a week, expect a corrective order and another reassignment west. When you have finished this task, you are to report directly to me and me alone. Do you possess a sufficient understanding to fulfill your duty? Gunter nodded and hiled, and was gone as quickly as he arrived. Alone with his hangover yet again, Hutu clenched his fists. He would uncover their corruption and finally correct the heinous mistakes of the superiors. Perhaps then he would no longer be forced to maintain order alone in Africa. He poured himself a drink. Let's hope this operation yields, yields fruit. The Ring of Fire. As the clocks chimed midnight, Hutu started to wake, almost falling out of his chair. His eyes painfully adjusted to the harsh white life, still set for this evening paperwork. Feeling his stomach shift turbulently as he stood, he barely stumbled towards the dimmer to dull lights. Slumming back in his chair, Hutu told himself that overwork had led him to falling asleep at his desk. Obviously, it had been nothing to do with the cognac he'd been drinking since breakfast. Temple thumping. He looked over to the desk, trying to remember what he'd been doing before he dozed off. It all came back to him in a sudden flash of incandescent fury. After dinner, he received a telegram from Germania insisting that he cease sending critiques of his fellow Rex Commissars. The pseudo degenerates in their plush might offices had threatened him, suggesting his constant criticism of those incompetent buffoons was tantamount to treason. Hands shaking with rage, Hutig poured a class up to the brim with cognat, uh, just to calm his nerves. How dare they suggest that? Drowning his cognat, relishing his bitterness, Hutig felt the fire of hatred grow in his belly. Not only could he not try not trust Germania, but was also surrounded by enemies, each waiting to sink their knife into his back. The treasonous dudes in the other Rex Commissariats, the traitorous boars waiting for their opportunity to slip free from the right, the slippery Italians up north, it was like being surrounded by the ring of fire, the flames advancing, always advancing, until the day they seared the flesh from his bones. He could not allow the degenerates and traitors to prevail. Hutig leaned back slightly and immediately felt that horrific bone-rattling creak, and his chair stab into his brain like a million wicked needles. The blood rising to his face, something inside him finally snapped. Slowly watched himself rise, grab the chair, and drag it outside of the balcony into the bracing night air, hauling it onto the marble parapet. Hutig used what remained of his strength to show the entire enormous leather chair off the edge. Steering into the lush blackness of his gardens, Hutig heard the chair shatter on the gravel below. Swaying from side to side, he lurched back inside and passed out on the office floor. His soul had gone mad, alone in the wilderness. It had looked within itself, and it had gone mad. <clears throat> hmm, which one do we want to do next? Yeah, Home of the Exiles, definitely. Followed up with, what, slave munitions. Who said that a slave can't fight for the Reich? Of course. They'd never be willing to take up arms for the defense of the master race, but this doesn't make them entirely useless. They can still work in our factories, supplying the Bravarians fighting for our homeland. Men, women, and elders, and all children, all will serve the Reich of a thousand years, no matter the capabilities, no matter their opinion. No matter the cost in human lives. Ost Afrikanische Soldaten. Rex Kommissar Hutig strode back and forth before the line of soldiers standing in attention in the baking midday sun. Irritated at being dragged from his work in the palace, he looked over them, each, sorting them each into two kinds of officers sent to him by the Reich, SS officers considered to be too ideologically dangerous for the pseudo degenerates in Germania, and a motley of uh, incompetence, idiots, and failures who had been judged deficient of more meritorious. Meritorious service. As usual, most would be useless. Bodies in uniforms sent to reinforce outposts or plantations. There were a handful of men who had showed promise, but they were the exception. The Rex Commissar had to admit that uh, to himself, for the most part, the men under his command were unmotivated, undisciplined, low in morale, and ideologically wayward. Well, he just had to make uh, find a way to make it work. Listen up, he barked. Sterling, some of the men who just began to doze off in the sun. Whoever you were in the past, you are now men of the Ost African Officer Corps, a band of brothers dedicated to the immortal cause of national daddyism. I understand that we come to the civilized this land, directed from the subhuman natives who do not deserve its bounty, and the pathetic colonists, degenerates who failed in the same task. Who took, took a deep breath. It's a great opportunity. You've been sent here to the boards of our beloved Reichs because our Führers judge you to have the strength to advance the Aryan race in the strange and wild land. So, though your new surroundings may seem strange, though you may yearn for your homes, do not forget that you are the most important bulwark against the subhumans and degenerates. Hutu could not expect many to be moved by speech. Most of them stared at him solemnly. Hutu was not blind to the concerns of his men. He knew many viewed all Africa as a punishment position and were reluctant to be there. Nevertheless, he also saw the gleam of words. I had provoked in the couple of men he had judged as being the cream of the crop. If only, been more men, if only he had more men like that, he could impose the ideals of national daddyism the whole, over the whole continent. No, more than that. The whole world would tremble at the feet of their rightful Aryan masters. For now, he thought ruefully he had to do what he could do with the dregs. Bears of a spark from the sacred fire, as we're doing of course slave munitions now to get more money, which sounds really, really nice. Uh, boards, general staff, sport, uh, master of the desert, master of the jungle. Hmm. Hunt for treason. Hutuk stared at the photographs before him, turning pieces of his last conversation over in his mind. He had succeeded beyond his wildest expectations. 
numerous inefficiencies, mass consumption of subversive media, forged documents, and in some cases, even subhuman administrators. It was a treasure trove of treachery and corruption. He had never been an emotional man, but the present moment moved him deeply. A wry smile across his face as he leaned backwards in his seat, all the paranoia, the self-doubt, the maddening fights with the superiors. <clears throat> it had been all meant something. A smiling showman, the cowardly degenerate, might finally be relieved of duty. Freeing the fatherland, he took himself of an entitlement insolence. The satisfaction was overwhelming. He rose from his desk and headed towards the door, however. Before he reached the handle, a flood of negative emotions returned, paralyzing him. Something felt wrong. If the bureaucrats in Germany had ignored his warnings once, what could, could they do so again? Even if the evidence seemed damning to him, would it be so to a man a thousand miles away? He needed more. So it was that Hutig returned to his desk and began drafting even grander plans. If he was a purge of filth from the continent, he wondered he would need an irrefutable, overwhelming assault. A new investigation would commence, even though even more thrilled than the last. The devil wanted to have his due. Hutig had waited years for such a moment. He could wait a bit longer. Begin the investigation. Your enemies are our enemies. Arms for Aryans. Um, what do you want? Prioritize assets development. Prioritize garrison development. Uh, help me to help you. Buoy trap the border. That actually be really good to do as well. Ooh, a land auction. Oh yeah, a land auction. Yeah, that'd be good to do as well. Political power. Mm, I'm gonna go down here. The Preishat Shilak uh, Initiative. In our effort to modernize West Africa, we've been given or have given Fritz Karl Preichschatt and Heinz Schlicke, military engineers attached to a garrison, the task to create an independent electric power line and a power plant within West Africa to ensure that we can exploit more modern technologies for sur surveillance efforts. The cost has been extremely high, and of course the power lines could reach only the main settlements, but Reichskommissar Hutig has nonetheless appreciated the effort, and with the inauguration of the Preichschatt Schlicke power plant in Kilme, he has officially ended the project, declaring it a success. Oh, look at this. Oh, a treaty. Oh, crap. Is this... Ooh, does this actually work? I think the last time we did this, it didn't really work that well. Promise evidence. Okay, so now we can do stuff. Collected and selected evidence against both the Rex Commissars. Started at $10 million, huh? Lightly investigate him? Thoroughly investigation. Secure funds from Germania. Oh, let's do Shank. Eh, let's do Muller. Thoroughly investigate first. We can do both. Why not? And now we're out of PP. Great. Just great. Well, we'll see what happens. I to completely forgot about this stuff. But I did delete the Navy. So, um, yeah, that is what it is. Uh, we don't have very much growth at all, but at the same time, at least, oh, we're going to be going down. Follow the example. Oh, not bad. And after once we get it like, completely down, we're just going to invest in the GDP as much as possible. Deeply inhaling the he heady scent. Hutig tipped his head back to swallow the cognate in a single gulp, saving its rich, bitter tang. It was enough to take him outside for a, of himself for a moment of indescribable bliss. He felt himself floating, weightless, until the cacophony of the cicadas and the glowing sensation of the sun's infernal rays on his alabaster skin drew him back to reality. Parting his eyelids for a moment, he saw nothing but a hazy silhouette as his eyes were forced to adjust to the harsh afternoon light. As his vision cleared, <clears throat> he saw a slave tied to a post, he bared his bared back facing the gathered dignitaries. Hutig lazily raised his hand, feeling the sweat pooled in his armpit coolly trickle down his flank. Proceed, he ordered, as slowly shifting his gaze to the officer with the whip. Crack. The slave cried out through the gag in his mouth as a furious red gash appeared across his shoulders. Crack. It was joined by another, as the blood from the first oozed down his back. Hutig held his hand or his glass behind him, where it was dutifully refilled. He sipped, frowning. The slave had been assigned such a simple task, to fix the teeth rattling, migraine-inducing creak in his chair, and yet this effortless chore somehow debated him. Setting the glass upon the table, Hutig looked at his underlings through the corners of his eyes. He enjoyed giving them a sudden summon to his palace, to test how obediently they would respond, and Bea had arrived within an hour, driving up from Kilimane, and Chmielewski had arrived soon after by helicopter from his villa. Mango had sent his apologies, insisting he was close to a breakthrough. It was his third time, making Hutig ponder if he'd actually had have to do something about him. They turned his stomach to Hutig. His subordinates were barely less degenerate than their own slaves. Bear, watching the punishment with barely concealed boredom, was a drunk and a glutton. Chmielski, on the other hand, had a slight, sickly light in his eyes and seemed to thrill at each crack of the whip. Hmm. He had heard of Chmielski's villa of the leather couches, book bindings, and lampshades made from the hide of disobedient slaves. Hutig felt his stomach turn with distaste. As he looked back to the slave, neither of them had anything close to his purity his strength. They were barely fit to call themselves Arium. Who take a watch the rest of the spectacle without passion? Slaves may not always be reliable, needing the whip to put them on the right path, but through the labor of these subhumans, he would be able to secure his legacy and turn South Africa into a titan of industry. Crown jewel of the Reich, smiling, he motioned for another splash of the cognac. The mind of man is capable of anything. And then what? More description would be nice. More doubt's not nice, but you know, whatever. 
Even more debt. Let's put a power. More stability, though, would be very good to get. Even though I think this is, we're maxed out on, on stability. This, this is as high as we can get right now, but. Colonial Rewards Program. In order to bring our former enemies to our side, we shall begin a program of economic incentives to Anglo farmers and industrialists. Of course, only do those who publicly display their support for the Reichs Commissar shall receive the subsidies. There's also a second secret award. Those who accept our rule and actively support us won't be persecuted and sent to the concentration camps. Networking deals next. After that one, of course. We're just going to skip more workers. Um, we lose stability for, for a couple of days. We get more construction speed and factory output. Uh, yeah, we're trying to build more prisons here. You're gonna have good power, just need more stuff here. Uh, reduce rations for 60 days. You need to get, get civilian. Ooh, civilian spending goes way down. Civilian spending factor. Huh. Alright. 0.16? 0 0.83? Report foreign corporate ties. Uh, agents have returned from the operation in Leopoldville, and the results are promising. Agent Blank waited for the net to infiltrate the HQ of Reichskommissar Müller. Henceforth, they were referred to as a suspect during one of his frequent trips to Hitterstadt, and preparation for a safari in the northern jungle. Having infiltrated his private quarters and personal office, he left unguarded as the usual security personnel left together with their master. Our operatives began the inspection. After several hours of thorough search, Agent Blank activated a hidden mechanism at the suspect's own desk, revealing a small room which contained the suspect's private archives. The folders were arranged in no discernible order, likely an intended security measure, and with only a little time left before morning, there was not the chance to decipher it. However, in what can only be called a stroke of luck, our operative found a photographic album detailing the suspect's meeting with several prominent corporate suites. suits. While most of them are in German, one of them, which has been copied and then put it back in its place, shows the suspect shaking hands with a Japanese man in his office. Not only are the two smiling at each other, suggesting a friendly relationship, but the desk is covered in documents, some of which are written in Japanese. Further investigations have revealed the man to be an important executive from Mitsubishi, one of the major Japanese industrial complexes. From the collective evidence, it appears clear that the suspect has been entertaining business relationships with members of a hostile power, a conduct violating Section 333 of the Strafgesetzbuch, punishable with up to eight years of prison. Further investigation is strongly advised in order to strengthen the accusations with more evidence. For the glory of the Baterlam, the eye of the truth sees through the darkest lies. Agent forced to cease uh, Sweet West African surveillance. Agents Blank have returned from the operation Sweet West Africa with less than satisfactory results. Agent Classify was out of conducting field surveillance in the hopes that evidence of collaboration or leniency between the rebel groups in Sweet West Africa and the authorities could be uncovered, unfortunately. The territory they were in was far more patrolled than initially thought. Agent Blank attempted to set up an observation position on more than one occasion, but nearby patrols forced them to change location. Eventually, the operative concluded that a surveillance operation was impossible to accomplish and they vacated the area, with little to no actionable intelligence uncovered. The operative insisted the frequency and intensity of the patrols had made it hard to accomplish surveillance without being uncovered and possibly captured. Given the delicate circumstances of the situation, it's understandable that the exposure and possible capture of one of our agents would cause enormous problems. Now, the working theory that the rebel groups and a local authority have been collaborating is true. A massive breach like that would risk the exposure of the entire investigation and all of our assets. We cannot discount the possibility that the rebels had advanced knowledge that they would be spied upon. An investigation of our intelligence network for any possible leaks is underway. Meanwhile, Agent Blank will be temporarily kept away from the public while they and their friends and relatives are investigated as well. For the glory of the Vaterland. Yes. You know what? We lose a little bit of stability. That's okay for us right now. Uh, so we can get anything, huh? Well, I'm guess I think we... Nothing? Hmm. We need 50 PP. That's so much PP. I want to thoroughly investigate, but that doesn't... Hmm, I don't know. We'll see what happens. You just want to pay all the debt, man. But the initiative is almost done. Launching the initiative. Which one are we doing next? I can't remember. Did I read anything next? Colonial Wars program. That sounds like fun. Yeah. This one. Launching the Preikshat Schlicker Initiative. Barely keeping a hold of his, his excitement, Rex Kumsar Hutig mounted the podium to join the Gates of Honor. Fritz, Karl, Preikshat, and Heinz Schlicker, two of the Reich's stars engineers. It wasn't often he got the opportunity to work with men of their caliber, and he didn't intend to let the opportunity to use their genius go to waste. Arranging their assignment to him had taken years of lobbying, cajoling, and bribery, and today would finally come to fruition. The TV cameras in the back of the vast concrete hall flashed to life as Hutig stepped in front of the turbine. After months of toil, the newly constructed Preikshat Schlicker power plant would be brought online to send electricity flowing through off Africa's veins, bringing the savage land one step closer to civilization. Glancing over the gathered journalists and dignitaries, Hutig took a deep breath and began to speak. 
Germans, friends, citizens of the Reich, today we do more than simply flick a switch. Today we bring a spark from the second fire of Aryan civilization to Africa. With this the latest in German innovation, we do what we the degenerates and subhumans before them could not. We scorch barbarianism from the slam. We shine a light in the chaos of the darkest kind. This is more than just a power plant, it is a symbol of our unwavering commitment to bring the glory of national daddyism to Africa. So we continued for some time extolling the virtues of Preikscha and Schlicke. No mention was made of the dozens of slaves who died in its construction, the dry bloodstains that lurked beneath the pristine concrete, the children who had lost their fathers. Finishing his speech, Hutig flicked the switch for the cameras and for a second was paralyzed with fear. What if it didn't work? What if all the cut corners made it fail, despite the tests? He would be humiliated in front of the entire world. It would be the end of his career, sweat beating from his forehead, as normally so disciplined mind swarming with irrational anxieties. Hutig felt his fear rise as the second struck by. Mercifully, it was soon over. Like a beating heart, the turbines thrummed to life. Keeping a tight hold of his expression, Hutig allowed himself an impressionable sigh of relief. It worked. It worked, and for now, that was all that mattered. Like a flash of lightning in the clouds, we live in the flicker. We don't need more money. Nothing there yet, which is fine. Colonial information stations? Sounds like fun. I think it gives more political power here. More support. Decryption is not bad. Decryption. Be happy or else. 101. Reinforce the Anglos. I want to say this stuff for last. Arms for Aryans. Mass of the Jungle. I forget which one. Did I do this one last time? I think I did Mass of the Jungle last time. But Mass of the Desert? I don't know. We'll see what happens. Board support staff. Political power. So the land grants. Our occupations left us with thousands of British colonial subjects. Much of which landowners now under our care. Unlike their masters in Canada, these men are mostly in line with their ideals, if not politically, at least pragmatically. After all, they do not want to lose their land to a native uprising in order to ensure their support and make our, uh, happy our allies in London, which will let them keep their lands. This should also grant us an interested partner in keeping the locals in check and a meat shield in case things go quite south. 7.9% not bad. Point 0.2 isn't very much, but that's okay. 4 billion is still very nice to have. Yeah, I only want to do, like, heavy investigations. And this is getting worse, maybe, but... Not bad. Mass literacy, you know, it is what it is. Industrial expertise, it is what it is. Everything else is going kind of down. Except for research facilities. Oh, look at that. Military professionalism is going up, too. Networking deals. Anglos, why are they such degenerates? So like Skimasar who take ponder this question as he lurched are lunched on his usual hearty but austere round up round laden and potato dumplings on the balcony of his palace. For once, it was pleasantly cool. The sun seeming to have forgone. forgone. It's, uh, forgotten, as usual bite for the day. The glass of cognac that had quickly become part of his every meal sat forgotten in his hand as he stared into the cloud of smog hovering over the distant Quillamane. Though they were a mongrel race, the parts that made up the English jigsaw were sound. Centuries of Germanic immigration and intermixing from Saxony, Jutland, Norway, combined with the Celtic blood of the early Bretons. The Celts, of course, being Germanic due to their distant origins in the mountains of what would one day become Austria, and yet, despite their racial lineage, the old English regime had completely given themselves over to Judeo-Bolshevist degeneracy. He wondered why folk of such strong Germanic blood had experienced such a total fall from grace. Taking a sip of cognac, Kutik, cursed the fact that the English had gotten to Africa before the Reich. Perhaps as a clean slate without the taint of Judeo-Bolshevist degeneracy, he would have had an easier time teaching the subhumans to dance to the national daddiest tomb. Even now, the Anglos infested their former colonies like maggots and a rotting corpse, and much to his consternation, his superiors would not allow him a free hand in dealing with them, though they sought to undermine the influence of the Reich at every turn. Scowling, who recalled the letter he had received that morning from Germania, apparently as a token of good faith, those pseudo-degenerates wanted him to approve the airing of an English-language radio program for the wealthy Anglo minority in Zambia and Zimbabwe. Well, if he had to, he had to. Still, who took promise himself he would not allow the Anglos to taint all African airways with their foul digital propaganda, finishing his cognac. He resolved that all English language media to be produced would need to have their scripts approved before airing, and would be closely monitored by Reich's political agents. They could have the radio show as long as they did exactly what they were told. For good or evil, mine is a speech that cannot be silenced. Your enemies are our enemies. If we want to avoid anarchy, we must convince all superior races that, in truth, we are all the same enemy. The subhuman slaves we employ in our factories, fields, homes, all wait for the moment they perceive themselves as stronger. Not a moment later, they will slaughter us like cattle, Germans, Boers, and even Anglos. If we want to survive, we need to stick together and present a united front while a united white front against a black menace, threatening to swallow us from within and without. Oh, that's not good. 11 points per cent. Oh, slight growth. Slight growth. Really kind of stagnated here, but whatever. Slight growth. Oh. So slow. Hmm. Make examples. You get more war spread stability. I kind of like that. Set up patrols. You get more stability too, which is pretty nice. Good. Guns, 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 everybody. Uh, yeah, the TNO is quite like, holy crap, what the heck. Uh, I guess we'll go to planning maybe. Yeah, I mean, we do have a few tanks here, but... 
Getting more defense and organization. Leg infantry. We do have some leg infantry as well. Hmm. Or less of pocket assumption. But it's only two organization. That's it. And you can always get some more uh, logistic, logistic companies if we need to. So we have twenty-four million dollars. That's not bad. Okay, so we do have one piece of evidence against Mueller here. Yeah, that's true. I thought I just, just didn't fire yet. Auto pay. Okay. It went back up, huh? Well, that sucks. Conscripted additional workers is gone. What? More construction speed? I don't want to spend political powers to do both of those. Yes. Let's see. In order to settle the control of our new Anglo subjects, we shall launch the East African uh, Broadcasting Company, the English spoken radio channel, to make them feel at home. Almost, of course. All personnel have been previously vetted and are fully adhering to the principles of national daddyism. Their program will put our government under bright light, and the location of the actual studios is a welcome secret. But we'll do that one after we do your enemies or our enemies, because I want that political power first. Promote loyalists. The Dunpont Agreement. Uh, let's, do, let's keep doing Mulder for now. As stonily impassive as a marble statue, who took stared across his desk like Clifford Dumpont, Juno Bureau representative for Ost Africa's minority of British colonists and exiles, all shrunken and wrinkled, he reminded Hutig of a piece of fruit that had been left in the sun for too long. Shivering in the Arctic frigidity of Hutig's office, Dumpont was reading the treaty that had been drafted by Hutig's underlings. I give the Anglos gifts of land to develop in the uncolonized interior in exchange for total and unwavering loyalty to the Reich and a public endorsement of the national daddyist values. Privately, he thought it was too lenient. The Anglos had been long been a simmering pot just waiting to boil over, and Germania wanted to give them land? On the other hand, he supposed. Also, Africa had tracks, vast tracts of land that, when cleared, would make fantastic farmland. Perhaps they proved beneficial to the Reich's prosperity, as long as he kept them within, within an iron grip. Hutu had to stop himself from smiling as Dupont finished reading and, and deflated like a punctured balloon. If he had his way, the degenerate Anglos would be deep in the coal mines instead of putting on a show for still being important dignitaries, but forcing them to dance along to his tune, uh, like marionettes, was the next best thing. Signing the treaty would commit Ost Africa's Anglos to Hutik and the national daddy's cause, in ink at least, giving him the legitimacy to persecute them should they ever stray from the path. He knew Dupont and his crew secretly wished to undermine his rule, cast him down, and take his room for their own. Feeling his suspicions coil around him like a boa constrictor, Hutig wanted nothing more than to send his rotting would be old would be backstabber to the camps with the rest of the traitors, but until he got the go ahead from Germania, all he could do was hope for to keep them under the jackboot. Dupont, of course, had no choice but to sign. If it was written, I should be loyal to the nightmare of my choice. Uh, yeah, I do want to expand the mines. Support staff would be nice, though. Uh, let's do that one to get the bonus for the land auction. The Boers have been proven to be ardent supporters of our cause. No matter how brave, they are extremely insufficient soldiers. Inefficient soldiers, lacking training, equipment, and skilled officers. In order to ensure the success of the righteous uprising against the decadent capitalist overlords, we shall send support staff to the Boers. Creates of uns uh, creates of supplies, military instructors, and small units of trained soldiers will help them to hold the line until they fill the gap with our baseline soldiers. The Lobster War ends. Oh, goodbye, Lobster War. Yeah, I mean, that's nice, but we don't have enough political power for us to really do that, so. 11.451. Ah! Dead interest. And it's still going up, but just barely. Basically not even going up, really. It's all because we got rid of the Navy. Gotta love it. It looks like it just auto-paid itself off. Well, 0.289 is pretty bad. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Sorry, though. Actually, do we get political power because of this? Cause, yeah, actually, we do get political power because if we have a deficit, then it actually removes political power from us. Misuse of military equipment. Agents classified and returned for their operation in Leopoldville, and the results are promising. After following Rex Commissar Mueller, henceforth to be referred as a, high, as a suspect to a Leopold Airport, our team managed to obtain a high resolution photo of him boarding a helicopter belonging to the Central Afrikanischer Luftwaffe, together with a Lakota, a Lakota uh, Ladok Katinola, and appear to be known to be the most prominent among his kind in the region of Yorobalan. After a few minutes, the helicopter took off for an unknown location. While the fact that the suspect is consorted with an inferior, not known to cover any role in the colonial administration, or the native SS is already cause for concern, what truly holds criminal relevance is that he boarded a military transport, together with someone who is, by any accounts, a private citizen, or better put, a slave, and such should never be allowed there. Such <coughs> conduct is in clear violation of the Section 266 of the Strasgewitz book, and punishable up to 10 years in prison. Further inquiries are advised in order to discover whether the suspect is misusing his powers in more serious uh, situations. To consort with the inferior is to consort with the enemy. Purging our own troops. Spilling into the room. 
the golden light <clears throat> of the morning jolt, jolted uh, hooted awake. Forcing his eyes open, breaking the crust that had formed, he gazed up at the whitewashed ceiling. After a moment, he wiped away the sticky tear residue that clung to his cheek and looked around him. Somehow he'd ended up in bed. Had someone carried him there after he passed out in his office, he felt his cheeks burn with shame, both from the indignity of being treated like a child and the added humiliation that everyone in the palace had probably already heard about him. Head thumping like a jackhammer, Hooty lay in bed for over an hour, staring up at the ceiling. He would have to reestablish his authority. He heard a tentative knock at the door, although he didn't respond. He heard it creak open and turned to see who dared to serve him. There, following a shuffling towards him. Hutik wanted to yell at him to get out, but he couldn't summon his energy. All he could do was croak, tell me what you want. All right, Commissar, allow me to extend you, to you my deepest sympathies that you have take, been taken ill, began Bea, sycophantic as ever, before he was stopped by Hutik's stare of piercing contempt. Even mired in the pits of the worst hangover of his life, he knew he still held power over the distinguished, dis dis disgustingly corpulent uh, lick spittle. Uh, <clears throat> well, the General Bureau are concerned about the commitment of our Boer allies. I knew to bring you immediately. Uh, yes, thought Hutik, so that you might squeeze a few kudos out of me. Pathetic. Must you bother me with every little thing, demanded Hutig, scratchily turning to Glare Bear. It is simple, emphasize to them, in a propaganda campaign, that we fight the same fight, that the same we have the same enemies. The natives, they seek to destroy everything we built, to annihilate the Aryan future. You will bring the boars closer to us. Use whatever resources you need. Now get out of my room. Bear obsequiously bowed out of the room, thanking Hutig for his wisdom. Hutig frowned after him, wondering if it was time to put Bear out of the pasture, or into a grave. As the leader, the men who seemed most loyal to you were the ones, of course, to watch. A groaning, Hutig fell back to continue staring at the ceiling, wondering if he'd find a new chair waiting for him in his office. After a while, feeling a little better, he telephoned for breakfast. The most you can hope for is some knowledge of yourself that comes too late. Kick the hornet's nest. Prepare the werewolves. That'd be pretty good. Colonial information stations? Yeah. That'd be good to do. You need more stability, too, which is pretty nice. Uh, we don't need more money yet, because we have 28 million, but I do want to investigate the shank, but... Ah, do it anyways, because we can. Any more resources from Germany that we need? Because it keeps sending us guns and stuff, so it's pretty nice. 0.289, everything's pretty much the same. 10.07, yeah, not bad. We need more consumer goods, but other than that, looking pretty good. 4, 0.432. Hopefully, it keeps going down. Now, we can do tax temp height to pay off the debt faster, but that'd really kill off our growth. Let's take a sick day. Hans Hutik's head pounded with every breath, hammered agony onto his eyes and stomach, running his sights of the Reich was challenging enough, and with idiotic staff at best and malicious at worst, heralding so loyal sons of the Reich to their deaths against the bloodthirsty savages. Now it pained him so much as, his, as to crane his neck. How could he do any more for this world and still suffer? Hutik massaged his temples as he sat up, and bile rocketed from his stomach, keeling the man over. Still, he mustered air and will into his throat as desperate hands fumbled for the bedside telephone. Get the F in here now, he sputtered. Bea yeah, stormed in the room. Hey, Hutik, I came as soon as I... He then stopped dead, registering the view, blinking once, twice, thrice with white eyes. Before him, the most feared man in Africa laid next to a puddle of yesterday's dinner. Hutik's eyes flickered to life. Bea, he groaned, stop gawking, and help me for once, you imbecile. Bea had seen things that would drive saints into insanity, but this... He stammered for an answer. Of, of course, my Rex Commissar. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm at your leisure here. Soup, Hutik sniffled, mucus dripping from his stoogy nose. Before I draw my gun and find someone who will, it took the attendant more seconds than appropriate to fashion a leave. At once, Hutik. Moments later, Bear returned with a tray full of soup and a handful of servants ladling generous helpings onto a bowl. As she fiddled with a pack of blue 88, the advisor blurted out the dismissal to his companions. Bear turned to other concerns as they left, like the pill on his hand. Years of assassination attempts had taught Hutik never to accept capsules under any circumstance. A second he second's hesitation. The advisor knew and he would be shot. Or worse, so when his boss's eyes squinted, a one swift motion had crushed the pill into his broth, and brought a spoonful of broth both into his gaping mouth. The tear of Africa's eye shot open and scoffed. If you think for a second, he yawned, that you can get away with this, you'll be, I will. Rex Kumasa, Hans Hutig, goes back to sleep. Bea stood over the sleeping man, pale as a ghost. C come again on the last spot, Hutig. Come again. Come again. More support staff. Yes, please. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Aaron Holidays. Agents blank have returned from their operation in Central Africa, and the results are promising. Agent classified. Traveled to Hitlerstadt in pursuit of people connected to Rex Kommissar Müller, henceforth to be referred to as the suspect in his corporate ties. The trail has grown cold to the Hitlerstadt resort, but the progress has been made nonetheless, as the team has managed to obtain the register with all the names of the guests who have visited the resort in the last year by bribing one of the employees. The reading proved extremely interesting, as alongside the usual German names, several foreign names have been found. While they aren't tied to any rebel seditious organizations, several, Katagawa, Smith, Aldrichi, to name some of them, belong to foreign industrialists and corporate suites, or suits. While the reason for their presence at the Hotel Lutus, it is certain that those people should never have been in Central Africa, since the Central Government has established a heavy embargo on any company or enterprise whose legal HQ are located within any country belonging to either the Triumvirate, OFN, or Japanese sphere. 
In fact, those people were emissaries from foreign and hostile powers, traveled to Central Africa, and resided for several days at the same hotels, enough proof to say that these people had very little interest in a vacation. Hillerstadt is, in fact, bordering a rather dull quagmire, and very far from the normal safari routes, and way more in establishing trade relationships with the suspect. A conduct violation, section 333 of the Strzok Gazette's book, punishable up to eight years of prison. Further investigation is strongly advised, of course, in order to strengthen the accusations with more evidence. The area needs not luxury, only duty. Joining the Hestiga National Party. Uh, do we have anything here for me? Nope. Mm. Join it? Yeah. Bewildered by the incompetence of the man he was trained, Captain Marcus Weidman rued his misfortune when he'd been called into the mayor's, uh, major's office and he'd been told he'd been handpicked for an inevitable assignment that gave him the opportunity to serve the Reich. He swelled with pride, picturing himself leading the charge against rebels in the interior. And said he ended up teaching idiotic Boer farm boys, where the trigger was on the Carnadier Ks. Sucking up and down the line, Watching his men completely fa fail to hit their targets, Captain Vadman wondered if the assignment was punishable for some forgotten slight. To his mind, the men of the Hextaga Nacional de Pato were nothing more than foolish, disorder disorderly rabble of the heritage of unclear Arianism. Unfocused, untrained, and undisciplined, they were little better than the barbaric partisans and rebellious slaves in that he had the incredibly and an unenviable task of whipping a mob of sunburned yokels into a disciplined fighting force foisted upon him. It was utterly ludicrous, and yet he had no choice but to accept his fate and slip into South Africa, eventually arriving at the HNP's secret train camp in Dessa Valley, where every breath filled his lungs with a thick coat of red dust. As he watched one of the boars look down the barrel of his gun to check if it was loaded, Captain Vadman wondered how Rex Commissar Hutuk had ever come up upon the idea that the HNP could be useful in the coming wars, anything other than cannon fodder. Sighing as one of the boars nearly missed shooting himself in the foot, Captain Vidman called for a break and went to wash the dust from his throat and with a lukewarm beard. He had been looking at the image of his own tenorous and passionate soul. Trafficking in Mines Agents Blank have returned from the operation in Leopoldville and the results are promising. Agent Blank traveled to Sud Castle, Bergbauunternehmen, an important mining complex, in order to uncover more information about the ties between Reichskommissar Müller, henceforth referred to as a suspect in corporate co corporations. There he managed to gain access to the accounting books, of which he had taken an ample amount of photos. The mine had been reserved to be operating normally, with an important volume of ore being extracted, but this fact is a match to the numbers, which show a business barely keeping afloat and constantly at risk of failing. What's worse, the personnel there doesn't wear the ordin ordinary uniforms of the security personnel, and their names couldn't be found in the official registers of the Heer or the SS soldiers attached station in the area, making it seem as if the mine is actually operated by a private company. Should this allegation prove true, this would mean that the suspect has ceded a public asset to a private business and allowed it to siphon funds towards an unknown, unknown destination, breaching the policies enacted in all the Reichs Commissariat states, with state, which state that all earnings from the resource production enterprises must go to the Reich's colonial treasury, a conduct violation of Section 266 of the Straf Gazette's book, punishable with up to 10 years of prison, as well as several other administrative laws, while further investigations to fully understand the death of the suspect's ties with the corporations. Oh, and they suggest further investigations. Follow the money and the traders are never far away. <laughs> Follow the money and you're going to find a Jew at the end. But, um... Hmm. Video über Wachsungslager. Wachsungslager. Finally, we can find a use for our new electric power line. Through the implementation of the Video über Wachsungslager. Or investment for indirect surveillance. This program, which involves setting up thousands of modern cameras all throughout the Rex Commissariat, will be implemented in the following months, as soon as the materials arrive. For now, we shall install a prototype in Quillamane to immediately begin tests and potential improvements, of course. Mm -hmm. Shank, is there anything here? No. Sadness. We got a lot of stuff on Muller, though. Mr. Muller. Hey, Muller. We got four on Muller. Jesus. Excuse my fun, but we're gonna wait. Shank, yeah, so if, if Müller is Müller is Müller. Müller it up. How's our budget? 9.9%, not bad. Hey, we got more growth this time, too. Anyone tell the Turkish War? Colonial information stations are always great, but East African broadcast taking a slip of water to wet his throat before the broadcast went live. Ted Conway took a further furtive glance. Oh, field operation sucks. Uh, at the man in the corner. He looked almost comical, uh, perched there on a high stool in his heavy uniform, glaring balefully around the room. His arms crossed and a permanent scowl plastered on his face. The craggy old devil reminded Conway of a ventriloquist doll. He almost smiled at the realization before he remembered that this man in the power of the cabin killed in dozens of unspeakably horrible ways. Paling, he snapped his gaze back to the soundboard and put his headphones on. As the recording of Box Brandenburg Concerto came to an end, the re actual, actual sign flicked a life. Glancing down at the script, Conway took a deep breath and began. Good morning, Rex Commissar South Africa. Welcome to East African Broadcast. I'm your host, Ted Conway. Joining me here is my co-host, Douglas McSweeney. Thanks to the benevolence of Rex Commissar Hutek, we've been granted a license to broadcast an English-language radio station to our show. 
and bring you news, entertainment, and the world of our Rex Kumasar to you every weekday at 5 o'clock. Today we have a special bulletin on the ongoing enormously successful electrification of rural Aus Africa, followed by a report on the unprecedented economic stability of the policies of Rex Kumasar Hutik, which has allowed us to enjoy. Dr. Cover. Reciting the carefully prepared propaganda they've been delivered half an hour before the show. By God, being a Nazi mouthpiece made Conway feel dirty, still was a paycheck, even if there was a constant threat of mysteriously disappearing should he ever slip up. He looked certifically at the sour old dude in the car and trying to gauge his reaction, but he looked just as bitter as usual. It made him uneasy. <clears throat> Conway sighed over his nose. Careful not to let the mic pick it up. Then, he gathered his strength, he launched into an explosively buoyant praise the Rex Commissar's new ex mind expansions. While the dream disappears, the luck continues painfully. Good operation. Uh, they come back from Leopoldville. And those looks have been disappointing. The team was uh, to able to infiltrate the central compound of the Central Avocana administration during the night in search of proof about the ties between Rex Commissar Muller and Sport, they referred to as, of course, a suspect, and several private corporations. Immediately, they looked at the central archives and started their inspection. But the next spectacle was the state of the archive. Rather than being organized following the usual recording techniques used by the bureaucrats all across the Reich, the photos and documents were stored with no discernible order. Security reports were found near receipts for the guards' food and newspaper articles about the suspect's hunting feats. We've no doubt that this chaos cannot be blamed on mere incompetence. Sure, this is a deliberate attempt at making the archives themselves impossible to analyze without the time for a full inspection, which would require weeks, if not months, with a team several orders of magnitude larger than what we can feel. As it is, this indirect uh, defense mechanism has worked, and our agents were forced to leave the structure at dawn before the personnel returned to the compound, having for all nothing to use for the investigation. The initial failure only makes the final victory sweeter. Well, that's one way to put a positive spin on it. Not bad, 10.4%, 5.37, 6. Not great. Oh, but not bad. Do we get any special events for this? Because with them falling apart, that's not good for anybody here. Get your free TVs. Be happy or else. <laughs> As a measure, to improve morale and quality of life for all members of the superior races, they shall be, be they Germans, Boers, or Anglos, the government shall subsidize a campaign to get a free TV to every household. With it, they'll be able to watch all channels broadcast from Germany, both entertainment and culture. Of course, what they don't know is that each and every app, uh, appliance has been fitted with a hidden microphone connected to the wiretapping branch of our security services. With this, we'll be able to control everyone inside and outside of their private sphere. And there goes Guiana. Goodbye, Guiana. Oh, we have eight uh, factories. Look at that. What are we actually making here? Nike tank artillery, Brooklyn guns. That's not bad. Use more of that, definitely. A United Arab Kingdom. Abdullah bin Al Hussein. Al Hussein. Mueller again. Papa Mueller. And there goes the debt. 0.429. Video Oba Vak Ungslanga. Pulsing through the cities of Ost Africa like blood through the veins of some slumbering vast beast, electricity slowly brings forth a spark of light across the dark continent. Only a fool, however, would think that the Rex Commissar Hutik electrified his five out of good intentions, of course. Well, look, much better. Sitting in his office, uh, and his enormous mahogany desk, kept glacially comfortable by a dozen oscillating fans, Hutik flicked through a folder of maps of major Ost African cities, Quillamain, Salisbury, Dar es Salaam. Marked out in bright red circles across each city were the locations of the new networks of surveillance cameras that a battalion of slaves were already hooking up to the modern electrical grid. They're designed to give a comprehensive view of major intersections as well as government buildings and areas considered to be potentially hotspots for sedition. This was but the first phase of the plan. Hutig thought with some concealed glee. He'd already placed another order with Siemens for hundreds more. Nice. Also, Africa was plagued with unrest from the barbaric Simeon natives and the seditious Anglo colonists, but they had a significantly less success stirring up trouble for the Reich when they had eyes on every street. Machines never aired. Machines were never disloyal. Once Wutig had machines watched over all of us Africa, he could finally breathe easy, knowing that they had any threat to national daddyism, and the objectives of the Reich would be easily detected. Gazing down at the realms from above, he could not find a squash of traitors like insects. Smiling with grim satisfaction, Hutig leaned back in his chair and was immediately assaulted once again by the migraine-induced teeth-rattling screech of the chair. Instantly, he was seized with rage. He tried everything to fix the darn thing, and nothing worked. As a matter of fact, it seemed to be getting worse. It was driving him to a distraction. He could have worked with that awful sound rippling across eardrums like a thousand vicious knives. Centering himself, he decided to order a new chair from Germania. He could also not let something such as ludicrous as a creaking chair affect him. So, resolving to bolster his Spartan discipline, Hutig told himself he'd indulge in even less luxury in the future, even as he poured himself another glass of cognac. Just to calm his nerves, it looked at you with a vengeful aspect. And be happy or else. Our government and the Rex Commissar Hutig, above all, exists to serve the Aryan Aryans brave enough to live in this lethal land to uphold our mission to expand the Laban's realm. In exchange for this protection, of course, we expect all Aryans to do their duty towards the Fuhrer and their entire race, yet... 
There, so, there are some asking for more. Our colonial government is doing as much as it can to protect all those who swear loyalty to the Swaska and the like of a thousand years. We won't tolerate egoists, defeatists, and worse than all, reformists all shall obey, or they will face the consequences of their disloyalty. Good. We get a prison too? Nice. Yeah, that minus 30% reduce rations. Can we actually get more here? Because we went from 8 now to 4, which really does suck, but... Maybe not. 10.2. 0.409. 0 .4, 0 hmm. That's not bad, though. Wait, why is the political power cost? Our deficit has the following effects. It costs us political power. Oh, wait. Oh, we have a deficit now. Wait, why do we have a deficit? Oh, that's why. Wait, what do we... We have a ship? Oh, I was making ships, my bad. Well, that makes sense. Give it a couple days and I'll update it, and then we'll be making more money again. Oh, well, that gives more growth, though, but still. Give it a couple days and it'll, it'll correct itself. Get your free TVs, though. Free TVs for all Ost Africa citizens. Supported by a vast underclass of slaves, Ost Africa has developed a comfortable, fat middle class of businessmen, specialists, and gentlemen farmers, all chasing their dreams of prosperity in the colonies. Every year, more Germans trickle into Ost Africa's quickly growing cities like water down a drain. Eager to seek their fortune, with, um, with them comes new ideas, political ideas. Like some sort of realized long ago, that a dangerous thought was not uprooted within his sprouts. It was spread across the land like a vicious wheat, corrupting all it comes into contact with. Had, he had nothing but a disdain for us Africa's intellectuals and petite bourgeois, but he knew that unchecked they could infect the rest of his domain with radical thought. Slave liberation? What foolishness. When the prosperity came off the backs of the Untermensch, clearly wealth and comfort made people think too much. And what better way to know the development of seditious thought than by filling their minds with propaganda? Like a wildfire sprouting in the desert after an unexpected storm, the Aus African TV network sprung up overnight to pour for, to pour entertainment, sports, and hoot approved news into the minds of Aus Africa's more affluent citizens. As a special demonstration of the Reichskommissar's benevolence, brand new Siemens TV sets were given away free all Aryan and, to all Aryan and Anglo citizens, so that they may share in the bounty of the modern age. And so the Aust Africans took the TV sets into their homes like Trojans receiving a wooden horse, never suspecting that inside every TV set hid a concealed microphone recording their every word. Aust Africa would never need fear sedition again, all washed over by the machines of loving grace. There is a taint of death, a flavor of mortality and lies. 100 for 1. Well, guys, let me know. Should we do Master of the Jungle, or should we do Master of the Desert? Should we do prioritize garrison development, or prioritize SS development. Let me know, and I don't remember which way I went last time, so let me know which way we should go this time as well. And let's end this one with expanding the mines. We need to do that. If we want to keep everything under control, we need to ensure both that we have the most enough supplies for a weapons industry, and that slaves do not have an, even an ounce of energy left to revolt. In order to achieve these objectives, we shall further expand the mining concentration camps across our domains. With the tens of thousands of additional workers, we shall increase the production rates, and our economic gains, which will surely be appreciated by the central government, and drastically reduce dissent, as those with the potential to fight against us are too busy with a pickaxe to effectively do a single thing. And you want to screw over you one more. 100 for 1. Help me to help you. Our poor friends are fighting just like us against the remnants of the decadent imperialist nations. While poorer than the average South Africans, they show the typical Aryan bravery that made us win the last war, and we should ensure that they are compensated for that. As a reward for their efforts, we shall institute the Deutsche Rhodesian Baufons, a bomb program to help develop the Rhodesian land that we will surely leave to our erstwhile allies after the war. Surely. They'll be grateful for that, and we will begin a long and fruitful cooperation. Spend a little bit of money. So if they make a stand against degeneracy, they shall be gain they shall gain greater tools against their oppressors. Our resilient spirit though. Spreading honey on the mother's homemade risen bread, Godfrey Cumberdale piped a uh, plop down in front of the new Siemens TV set and flicked it on. Another day home from school was fine as far as he was concerned, even if a vicious coal was the price he had to pay. Why do you need to learn German literature anyways? He was going to run the farm, just like Papa. After what for a ten year old boy felt like forever, an image finally popped on the screen at the stroke of seven o'clock. It was the usual start of the broadcast day, footage of the Reich and the Ost African flags flying side by side as the Deutschland's lead played an ear blasting volume. Godfrey ignored the boring old songs he wolfed down his breakfast. Much to the irritation his irritation. The image cut to a shot of Rexkomasar Hutig sitting behind a desk. Boring. Can I skip this and go straight to the cartoons? He wanted to watch the new episode of Captain Uber fighting the Judeo Bolsheviks. Citizens of the Reich began the Rex Commissar, I come to you today, and that was when about Godfrey stopped paying attention. Although I felt a tinge of guilt for thinking it, the Rex Commissar creeped him out. He looked like a porcelain doll, pallid and expressionless. While Godfrey got up to get a glass of milk, he listened absently to the Rex Commissar. He was saying that all the projections for stability and economic growth had been massively overachieved, securing Ost Africa's place as one of the Rex's most prosperous regions. After that, he rattled off a list of figures and facts that made little sense of Godfrey as his image cut short clips of new gadgets going on sale and the capital and smiling blacks going to work in the mines. Sitting back down in front of the TV, 
Godfrey caught the final words of the Reich's Commissar's speech. Germans, also Africans, be proud for a great nation has approved, approved the strength of national socialism against barbarianism. Together we've created the most efficiently run state on earth. Onwards to an airing future. Those words sent a thrill through Godfrey. If the Reich's Commissar said everything was going well, then it had to be right. At last, Captain Uber began, and soon he had forgotten all about the Reich's Commissar in his speech. I saw that on... Uh, I saw on that ivory face the expression of somber pride, of ruthless power, and of craven terror with Mr. Fancy Haircut. But if you enjoyed today's episode, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we'll keep staring at the economy tab and making sure that we keep having a surplus. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.